You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, friends, Clever listeners. For the next few weeks, we're taking you on a little trip down memory lane. Clever launched in 2016, and since then, we've met so many talented folks and shared their fascinating personal stories that we thought we'd revisit a few of them. So we handpicked a selection of some of our favorites that are definitely worth a second listen. And if you miss them the first time, you are in for a real treat. We'll be back in September with some exciting and shiny new episodes for you. In the meantime, I hope you'll take us with you in your ears and in your hearts on all your summer adventures. I want to be with you on your bike rides, on your road trip, and lounging with you in a hammock. Okay, so we love and appreciate you a ton, and please do stay in touch on social. See you soon. Hello? Hello, Mimi. Hi, how, how is this? There's a lot less background noise. I think we okay, should good. try this. Oh, wait. Okay. Mm. Some echo. Are you getting yeah, echo? Yeah, I'm getting too, some Jen? echo, too. Oh, no. Okay. Hold on. I'm moving around. What I tried to do was, like, a lot of little rooms in here, and maybe <laughs> this one, there's not enough stuff in here. Well, thank you for being a good sport about this. <laughs> this is actually really good. Okay, good. So now I'm in a different place. <laughs> okay, don't move. <laughs> okay, I will not move. Hi, everyone. I'm Amy. And I'm Jamie, and this is Clever. Before we get started today, we wanted to acknowledge that our listenership has grown over the past few months. So welcome all you new listeners. We are so grateful that we've been able to share all of these stories with you and appreciate all of your support. So if you're digging clever, we would love it if you would leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. It really helps us spread the message of great design to more people. Yes, it does. And now on with the show. Today, we are very excited. We have fashion designer Mimi Plange. Mimi Plange is perhaps one of the coolest girls I could ever hope to meet. But she's also got a healthy dose of design geek in her, which I love. She was born in Ghana and immigrated to the U.S. when she was just a young thing. And she always knew she wanted to be a fashion designer, but she took a detour to study architecture at the University of California at Berkeley before getting her degree from San Francisco Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising. Then she moved to New York and worked in the fashion industry for about a decade before launching her own namesake ready-to-wear label in 2010. Her pieces are spotted in all the magazines, Vogue.com, Marie Claire, Essence Glamour, Nylon, Harper's Bazaar, you get the point. And on celebrities like former First Lady Michelle Obama, Vanessa Hudgens, Serena Williams, Rihanna, Paris Hilton, and Janelle Monet. She's recently started collaborating with furniture and decor brands like Roche Bobois. Let's hear her story. Name is Mimi Plange, city is New York, and I'm a fashion designer because there's nothing else that I've ever wanted to be. That's why. Well, that's a good reason. Better do the one thing you, you want to do instead <laughs> of the, the million things you don't want to do. So let's start at the very beginning, Mimi. I read that you were born in Ghana. Can you kind of paint the picture of your childhood for us? Like, what was your town like, your family, your upbringing? Even though I was born in Ghana, I came to the U.S. when I was five years old, so I don't remember really too much about, you know, what it was like. I know that I went to school there because I saw pictures of me in the uniform, like, you know, in the area, but I really, really don't remember what that life was like because we came to the U.S. when I was five, and, you know, the stories that I've heard that, you know, we came here not to really stay here. It was just supposed to be a vacation. And somehow in between there, my dad left us. And so it was like my mom in the U.S. with five children. And I don't know, our life just totally changed from the stories that I hear from my siblings. And so growing up for me was what I do remember from the start of like coming to the U.S. And we, we started in California and started in a town called Ontario and we were all kind of split apart in the beginning because my mom had to have like her friends or people that she knew that were from our country or people that, you know, family members or friends, they all like took us in. So we were all separated and I was with one of my sisters and then one of my sisters was by herself and then my brother was with another sister. And then my mom was just like working all the time to like get us back together. And then, you know, she did. All my siblings are like five years older than me. And then I'm like a part, and so I've always kind of 
had my own little world, like living within these little, they seemed like, you know, such adults to me, I guess, when I was little, just kind of like being in their world and being their space. So we finally all got together like a year later, and then we started living in Ontario, California, in a not so great neighborhood. But, you know, we lived there and my siblings were like really into scary movies. And so they would torture me and I'd have to watch all this horrible stuff, like <laughs> movies like Faces of Death. Oh, no. Oh, my God. <laughs> like, and I was like a little girl, but they didn't care. And we would watch like all these, I mean, they love scary movies. And then on the flip side of that, like there was all this like fantasy, like The Dark Crystal and Labyrinth and all those movies like that and Star Trek and Star Wars and that world. And so that was kind of like what was going on in my house. And so, you know, we were in this world that just wasn't like a really good neighborhood, you know, to be in. And then like we had this inner life that was, you know, filled with like fantasy and, and I guess escape. That was kind of like what was going on in the house. It was always like really fun, despite everything else that was you know, happening. So you, you mentioned that your dad left. Did you feel abandoned? Do you have a relationship with your dad? What was your relationship like with your mom after that? I didn't feel abandoned because I don't remember him that much. And so for me, I think being around the age five and six, like when things like that happen to you, I don't know how, I mean, it affects people differently, but for me, it's just like he just wasn't there. Mm -hmm. And I didn't think of it very much. If I would go to like a friend's house or something like that, and then I'd see their parents together, you know, I'd probably, I noticed it a little bit more. But, you know, I felt like, you know, my mom was like everything to me because for me, seeing her like work so hard to, you know, make sure that we were all okay and all the things that she was doing, even though I didn't see her very much when I was little, I knew that, you know, she really loved us. Like it always felt that way. You felt that undercurrent of like strength and support and scrappiness on your behalf that made you feel like loved. Yes. Yes. Always. Like, and it wasn't like something where it was like, I had to see her all the time to know it, or she had to even say it all the time. It was like, you knew from just her every action and everything that it was all for us. So I didn't feel like a loss. And I think it's only because I was so young. And your siblings, how did they process this? And did you feel like you had this experience a little bit vicariously through them? Or did they protect you from any sort of trauma that they were going through? I think it affected them more because they knew him you know, um, more than I did. And I could see it through, especially like just growing up and getting older and things that we say to each other and who's longing to see him and who wants to go see him and, or things like that, that we just talk about now, I can see how it affected all of us differently. You know, there's more of like a connection. I mean, it's sad to say it, but I mean, it's just what it is. If you don't, you know, know, or I mean, I don't really know. So I just think there's more of a connection with them than there is with me because I just don't remember, you know? Your life in Ontario, which you kind of described as not a great neighborhood and a lot of fantasy and fun going on in the home and consistent love from your mom. And it sounds like a close knit network of siblings. Did you feel displaced or did your siblings feel displaced or did you feel like it was an adventure or somewhere in between? I think that... I've always felt this place. I've never really seen myself fitting in. You know, we came from somewhere and then I came into this world and inside our house, the dynamic was very traditional. I mean, everyone spoke the language at home and, you know, we ate traditional foods at home and things like that. And then, you know, outside of that, I'm pretty much the most Americanized one because I came here when I was very little. So then I had this whole dynamic of like my friends and what was going on in their world and what it was like for them to experience, you know, being born here and growing up here and having this culture. So I always had the two different, you know, cultures at the same time. I've always been able to have a lot of different, I guess, worlds and different things going on around me because we were always like doing different things. It was like my mom, you know, she made it like an effort to tell us that, you know, we weren't poor, even though we kind of were poor. And so, or, or tell us that it was like, you know, a state of mind or it's not, you know, this is not who you are. You know, she made it a point to make those things very, very clear. So it's just something that I think we all kind of grew up believing. 
Did you stay in Ontario and go through high school in that area or did you move? We moved to Rancho Cucamonga, like in right in junior high school. I moved into a completely new neighborhood and had totally different experience. So we went from this life where like everyone had been saving, saving, doing all this stuff and, you know, having kind of like this tough life. And then all of a sudden going into like having this, you know, much nicer apartment and having a whole kind of new lifestyle, going to a new school that's just different, has like more activities and offering more things and, you know, showing me like just new things that I hadn't seen in the neighborhood that I was in before, but I mean, I'll circle back to say that like growing up, even though like we grew up in a bad neighborhood and things like that, I did have some exposure into the creative arts because I was like a doodler. I was always, I think, cause I was always in a fantasy zone of wanting to watch all these like crazy movies, like the legends and all that stuff. And I just think it always made me want to just do something that was art related and creative. What was the reason for that move? What prompted the move? The move was basically the hard work that my mom and and my oldest sister kind of had into like saving up and, and changing our lifestyle, you know, and then we got to move to, you know, my mom had a better job at that time. She had done all these things that she needed to do to get to a certain point. And then we just ended up moving to a better neighborhood so we can go to better schools. So you were doodler, you know, you used creativity as a sort of escape, as a lot of young kids do. Were your mom and your brothers and sisters, were they supportive of that hobby? I think they didn't think much of it in the beginning. I think that they noticed it was something that I did very often, but I just don't think that they paid attention to it because my mom, to her, like everything that was, you know, really being amazing was becoming like a doctor or a lawyer or something practical, you know, and she'd always talk about like the arts as being like some, some place that's fun that you can do on the side, but you probably won't really make money doing this kind of activity. (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Right. Right. Exactly. She was always really clear about that. I don't know. I just, we we all played like musical instruments and that was kind of my thing back then too, is I really wanted to be a musician. (laughs) Flute. Ah. Yeah. I was a little flute player and I was kind of into, I started when I was seven and I took lessons and I did competitions. I played all the way up up into college and then I decided I was going to do something else. So we were always involved in some kind of the arts, but I was lucky to have, I, I guess I would say an uncle because in our culture, like anybody who's older than you or whatever that comes to your house, that's your, your mom's friend or something like that is, you know, your aunt or your uncle, anyone. So you just have to give them that. So I had this uncle that used to come and um, his daughter and I were the same age and he was an architect and he also was a painter and he used to come and pick us up during the summer to go to his house and have lessons and things like that. And he would make us watch movies like Amadeus and we would listen to operas and he would ask us, you know, how we felt about them and he would have us draw each other and just like everything was like an art lesson or a lesson about some kind of culture or the past or something historic. And, and I just remember just loving it, you know, everything about it. And it just made me dream about like this world that seemed so far away that had he maybe not exposed it to me, I might not have, you know, it wasn't within my sight, you know, it wasn't within the world that I was in, but he you know, being a painter just exposed me to that. And as soon as I saw that, I just knew that I had to work. I had to do something in that realm. You know, I had to do something creative. And so that's kind of what really, you know, sparked it all. So because he was an architect, is that kind of why you decided to study architecture at Berkeley? That was part of the reason, yes. That's definitely what set it off. Um, But the thing was, I had decided that I wanted to be a fashion designer like like I would say like around 11, 12, I was pretty sure that that's what I was going to do. But when I had tried to explain it to my mom and my family, they were like, um, that's not <laughs> a real job. So let's think <laughs> about something else. And so I thought, okay, well, why not try architecture? Because that seemed practical enough and still creative. And then I had done my research because I was always reading about fashion designers and this and that. And Gianfranco Ferre had been an architect before he was a fashion designer. So I felt like, okay, this can be a route for me. This is something 
I can do. This can be part of the plan. And that's why that happened. Oh, that's fascinating. So often, I think creatives end up choosing this first college education that's sort of a compromise between something that's creative, but not that practical and something that's more practical. So architecture is a great example of something that's very grounded in real world practicality and also very creative. And I love that you were premeditating your plan to fashion design. It wasn't (laughs) really even an accident. And your pieces have a lot of architectural elements in them. So the puzzle's coming together, Mimi. (laughs) No, it totally did. It totally did. (laughs) It informs my work. Yeah, for sure. I can see that. Tell us what the college years were like and then uh, what you did during and after college. So college for me, I mean, UC Berkeley was really fun. I got there when I was 17, so I was still, you know, not really supposed to be doing a lot of things yet. But I was always kind of a little square to myself and in my own world. And my roommate, you know, she was like, like really fun and really outgoing. And so I kind of opened myself up, I would say, as soon as I got there. I had fun, you know. I had been really kind of quiet into myself a little bit in high school, not all the way. I was still in activities, but it just seemed like you could do anything, you know, and you <laughs> could be anything and you could meet new people whenever you wanted to. And it just seemed so fun to me. And I mean, I like school too. I like reading and I like being in an environment with other people and I've always liked it. So college for me was an adventure, like everything that I just could decide. I felt like I could do whatever I wanted and I could just, you know, it was just fun. I don't know. Yeah. (laughs) Love to hear that. That sounds like the actual description of a flower blossoming. (laughs) Yeah. And I think if you love learning and you're finally in a discipline or studies that you really enjoy learning about, there's just like so much enthusiasm and excitement and your hunger just increases by the second. That's exactly what it was. It just felt like you were in this space where, you know, your parents weren't there, no one was there and you could just find yourself. And I look at everything in that way as like, you always have the opportunity to do whatever it is that you want to do. And, you know, you can take it and you can mold it and you can create it and you can, you can do whatever. And so I started, you know, getting that energy a lot when I was in college. Can you tell us about the transition from architecture to fashion? Cause you did go to get a fashion degree at San Francisco, a fashion Institute, right? Yes, I graduated, I think, in May, and I started fashion school that July, and I just wanted to do, like, an advanced program and be done and move to New York. Like, it was all still part of the plan, and fashion school was different. I mean, at Berkeley, I think I was having more fun, but I was really happy that I got the education that I did at Berkeley to show me, like, the world of being with a lot more of a variety of characters, and I feel like, you know, fashion school... You know, there's this thing for fashion and what it's going to be like and all these things. I felt like when I really moved to New York and got into the world, I don't know. I felt like fashion school was very different. I don't know if it was like really telling you or maybe no school does like what the real world is really going to be like. And so I moved to New York right after I graduated. Like it was like three weeks after. You had a plan and you were executing with precision. (laughs) Yes. It's been a plan the whole entire time. (laughs) I know I'm crazy. So yes, I moved to New York and I was like, okay, I'm going to find a job. I don't know what I'm going to do, but, and I didn't know anyone in New York. And so I started like applying everywhere and taking my resume and just putting it everywhere. And I was like, well, you know, my portfolio is pretty good. I'm sure I can get a job somewhere, but my dream was of course like Dior or, you know, some big fashion house. It was like, of course they'll take me, you know, (laughs) with my big dream. And then I got to New York and I was like, (laughs) Oh, (laughs) Maybe it's not going to work like that. And then I started learning that (laughs) there's a lot of fashion companies and, you know, some that they never really talk about in school, like all these like bigger companies like fast fashion. And like I would say the bulk of the industry is made up of these, you know, brands like Express or, you know, mid-tier. I think a lot of times in fashion school, you're always thinking about, you know, LVMH and Dior and like the top you know, cusp of it, but there's fashion on so many levels, on the contemporary level, on the Missy level, and there's maternity wear, and there's children's wear, and there's, you know, all types of things, and so 
you know, you get to New York and you're in the fashion industry. And I got my first job as a merchandiser at this jewelry company. And it wasn't exactly what I wanted, but I just felt like I had to get my foot in the door and it was still fashion. And it was making accessories and jewelry and hair accessories and things like that. And I would do the merchandising of it. And a funny story that happened when I was there was we used to do a lot of licensing for celebrity brands and things like that. And um, I remember we had a meeting with Tina Knowles, Beyonce's mom, and she came in to look at some of the accessories because we were going to possibly do a deal with her. And so I had to do the presentation. And I remember being so crazy and, and getting my portfolio together and making her like a special little package to give to her to let her know that, you know, I was like an awesome designer too. And then later on, much, much later, through a whole different way, I ended up working um, in the industry and starting Beyonce's clothing line, her Darion line, which was a lower price line from her house of Darion. And so that was many years later. I was working as a merchandiser. Then I got a job doing menswear at Rockaware. So I was working for Jay-Z's company and Damon Dash at the time. Also, Rachel Roy, um, who later on went and had her own clothing line. And I started there in men's, and I grew really quickly. I was about 23, and I became, like, the head designer and the VP of design for, um, I'm the creative director for the women's division. After that, I left and started Beyonce's brand, which was called Darion, and I did that for five years. And I was the vice president of design for that company. And during the time, I just was saving all of everything because I knew I wanted to have my own mind. So that was always there, even though I was working in, you know, two major street brands that, you know, at the time were, you know, amazing. Because when you really think about it and you think about urban streetwear, to have been able to define a certain type of clothing in a moment of time, I mean, that's amazing fashion, you know. That's a contribution to culture. It definitely is. And even though at the time I was just thinking, oh, I want to work for all of these, you know, major big houses. But had I not had those experiences, I got to, you know, travel the world and and learn how to do business on, you know, on a different level. You know, because at the end of the day, you're selling clothes, you're selling dreams. You want to touch people with what you make and you want people to be affected and and want to adorn their body with your clothing. So you have to be able to do that on a lot of different levels, I think, if you're a great you know, fashion designer. So that was amazing. And then when I could and I was able to, I met my business partner, who at that point was my boyfriend. And he was always, you know, pushing me. He was like, you know, you're so talented. You need to start your clothing line. What are you waiting for? And I was kind of just like feeling like, okay, it has to be like this and it has to be perfect. And I have to get all these things. And then finally he was just like, no, it'll change probably over time. It doesn't have to be perfect. You just have to do something. And then finally I just, you know, was like, I'll do it. And I did it. So, um, and that was when I was 30. (laughs) What was that like? Were you terrified or were you excited or a mixture of both? I'm always terrified and I'm always excited. So, <laughs> Oh my God, you're so cute. <laughs> so yeah, it was those, you know, it is those, but like, it's kind of like you just have to fight through it because I mean, there's always going to be things there, you know, there's always going to be obstacles. There's always going to be, you know, something. So I just try to think about things and steps. And I just felt like, you know, we wanted to create a luxury brand And we were coming from a place that was not that. And so many times in fashion, you know, like there's this thing of like this world and these people in this world that you can't get close to, you know, for whatever reason. You know, I just felt like it's a a new day where I feel like, you know, as a designer, you aren't just like making things that you want. or Well, to me, you aren't just making things that you want or what you like all the time. It is what you like. And, you know, sometimes it is what you want, but you also have to think of the woman or the man or the person or the child that you're designing for and what's going on in the world and what the thoughts are and where the movement is going so that you can dress this person to where it is that that person is going, whoever it is that's in your mind. And for me, you know, the woman that I want to dress is a woman who has been able to, you know, build her own world, you know, set her own limits, have her own thoughts. She doesn't need any monogram to, you know, say, I'm wearing something luxurious. She has her own sense of self and she's interested in what she's bringing to the table. She has her own style sense. She's created her own world. 
you know, and I feel like there's this new democratically minded consumer who's building their own businesses and, you know, creating their own podcasts and doing all types of things. These new women who have places to go and, you know, things to do and, and they're new, you know, because we're in a new day. And so I'm just thinking, how can I dress this woman? Because to me, that woman is kind of like me, you know, too. Yeah. I hear you in this and your mom. <laughs> yeah. Probably. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love what you're saying about this new day. I think it, it really resonates with me, too, because I feel like I'm also that woman. Yeah, I do, too. I don't need to buy into anybody else's idea of what's fashionable. And I don't need a monogram to tell people who I am or what I'm about. Yeah. Sometimes I feel like that's partially just me getting older <laughs> and being comfortable with who I am as a person, as a woman, as a, an entrepreneur, et cetera. But I also do feel like there's so much more of a democratic situation that, that we're in right now where we have so much more control about how we define who we are and how we define the things around us, especially with like, you know, blogging and social media and like, you know, anybody could become an influencer and you just never know. So there's just so much more opportunity and, and power out there for people to kind of seize their own destiny. And that's what we're moving towards. And I don't think it's going to close back up. I think it's going to continue, you know, to open. And I think when you have any kind of business, you have to be flexible to a certain, you know, point. And you have to see what are the moves and how are things drifting. And right now, they want to see you. They want more transparency. They want you to see them. They want to be included in the process. And then how do you create fashion now that resonates with this new movement? Because you can't think about you know, the old way of thinking, you know, the old way of thinking is let's just put this logo, get a few stars to wear it, you know, blow it up into this big thing. And then, you know, that's it. And I think people are showing that's not enough anymore. And so now we have to address these new thoughts and these new wants. And, you know, how do we give them clothing that is going to help them, I guess, tell their stories to a certain extent and, and to show who they are and what they like and what their individuality is. Because I think, it's going more towards that. I mean, I don't want to look like anybody else, you know? I mean, I can look at magazines and look at things, you know, for fun and inspiration and things like that, but I don't say, oh, I want to look like this person. I think a lot of us want to look like ourselves more so now, I think, I hope. You know, that's, that's how I'm seeing it. Yeah. Speaking of the democratization of luxury, Michelle Obama has been seen wearing your pieces and you've also been invited to the White House for the celebration of design. And I heart Michelle Obama so hard. And so I'm a little bit jealous and excited and nervous all at once <laughs> to hear your story. But I want you to tell me everything about it. First of all, when Michelle Obama, when we learned that, you know, she was interested in wearing our pieces, we just kind of thought it was unreal. And, you know, we went through the process. We made the clothes. And then, you know, we just kind of waited. And my sister was the one who texted me at that time. I was actually still working and I was still doing like a lot of freelance work. So I was somewhere, you know, working. My sister texted me and said, oh my gosh, Michelle Obama's wearing your skirt on The View. And I was like, oh my God, I need to get to the TV. Like, I need to get to the TV screen like right now. And there was like no TV anywhere. I couldn't oh. find anything. And so I was like going crazy. I was like, I hope you're like, you know, recording everything. And it was just like, it just didn't really seem real. It didn't, I mean, I was totally thrilled. But when I talk about it, it's just, I don't even know what to say still because you just could never imagine that something like that could happen. You know, it's just so rare. And I felt like, you know, when she, when she came in and she's been so supportive of so many designers, but there's still so many designers. So she's still picking through and, you know, seeing, you know, what she, she wants to wear as the first lady, as somebody who's presenting, you know, this, this country. And so, I mean, my mom will like tell the story like so many times. She was like, you know, this little girl from Ghana and she came here and she was dressed, you know, the first lady. And she like goes crazy about like the whole story, but I just think it's, it's crazy. I don't know. It's unbelievable, you know? And then time passed, a little time passed. And then one day, you know, we're sitting in our office and we get an email and it says from the office of the White House. Oh my God. My heart stopped. And 
And I was like, is this real? I was like, this is fake. It's not like, and, I, and it was just like a regular email. <laughs> like I just opened me. it up. <laughs> I know. And I was like, is it going to like self-destruct in like five minutes? And they were like, what is this? You know? And um, I was like, oh my gosh, is somebody like coming here? Are we being like bugs? And I'm thinking all this stuff because I'm crazy. But it was, you know, this email. And it said that you're invited to celebrate the Celebration of Design dinner with Michelle Obama. And I was like, you know what? I just like closed back the email. I was like, I don't even think this is real. So I'm just going to wait. I didn't respond to it. And, um, and we were just like laughing about it. Then the next day in WWD, which is like this fashion trade magazine, um, Women's Wear there was an article. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And there was this article in there about how a few designers had received invites to this celebration of design dinner event at the White House. And then when we saw that, we were like, oh my God, it's real. You know, <laughs> it's actually really, really real. And so we were like, we better respond before they change their mind. <laughs> so, um, you can't be ghosting the White House. <laughs> you know, so we signed up and then I, I didn't tell anyone. I didn't tell anyone. I couldn't even tell anyone because it was like, you know, it wasn't really real. It was like, are you going there? And I was like, until it happens, I'm not saying anything. And we were like, we're going to shut up. We're not going to say anything. <laughs> and we're just going to go. And so then the day came and... And then it was really, really, really real. And we went and it was like amazing, amazing, amazing. And um, we met Michelle Obama and she was so sweet and so wonderful. And she said she liked my hair, which is really crazy. So (laughs) that made me happy. (laughs) And um, and, um, that was it. And so we just had like the best night ever. And all, you know, all the designers who've ever dressed her, um, were there and also it was also an event there were like a lot of little seminars for children who wanted to be in the creative field so it was also you know great in that way it was informative and there was a lot of designers there to to give talk it was it was amazing I mean it's definitely you know a chance of a lifetime thing to celebrate and to have her she actually greeted every single person who was invited you know it was amazing I absolutely love what a champion of design she's been. And she's used her time as FLOTUS to really push forward the cause of design and the value of it to children, which is, uh, it makes me get all emotional. (laughs) I I just love, I love what a champion of design she is. And I'm so thrilled for you that you got to have that experience. That's so awesome. I mean, seriously, like that's an American dream story. Like, you know, your family moves to a country and you're all in, in a, you know, you have to be divided up. And then one day you're dressing the, the first lady. That's just like huge and awesome. Thank you. I do want to ask you about running your own business. Did you have any business experience before you... Well, I know that you had worked in in a number of other labels, but did you take any of that forward with you? Or did you take any business classes when you were in school? Well, when I was in college, I did take a few business courses because I was thinking about minoring in business at some point. But then I decided to minor in theater instead. And so I did take a few courses... But I think I really learned a lot about the business through the growth spurt that I had, you know, during the years that I was working because I got a chance to listen a lot to, you know, the upper management team. And especially when I became the VP of design, it really opened me up into what it's like to work with a lot of different people and to make things happen. And I think a lot of times when you're a designer, sometimes sometimes, you know, we can be brats about things that we want or, you know, when we want things a certain way or have to use a certain button or it has to be this fabric and things like that. And then taking it on a bigger scale where you're thinking about it for the business and what makes sense and what can you do to bring the price down a little bit so that more people can buy it and, you know, things like that. And so I think it gave me the other side, which I think really balances out a lot of the business decisions that we make. Because it's not just about creating all of these, you know, crazy, you know, fashion things, you know, but there has to be a balance. You have to make some things that, you know, maybe can go into a museum and be that thing. But you also have to make things that women can wear every day, you know, not just look at it and say, oh, my God, that's so beautiful that I would never wear that because it's a business. And so if we're only looking at it and never want to put it on our bodies, 
then we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing either. So I think it gave me a lot of the other side of like, you know, the business decisions that are, that are being made, like even simple things as ratios to how many tops you make to bottoms and how do you deal with stores? You know, what incentives can you give them to make them want to come to you and look at your brand? And so I feel like all of that. And, and one of the major things I would say is, you know, the opportunity of traveling and meeting different people because to me in fashion, you cannot, I don't know if you can really go like all the way up there without working with a lot of different people because, you know, you have to work with all the press teams and you have to work with, you know, people who are going to sew and make everything and you have to work with whoever's going to do your accounting. And there's always all these people around you, I mean, probably in every field, but um, you can't do it really just by yourself. Like it's not going to work that way. So one of the key things I think about being a fashion designer is just really being able to relate to people and being able to talk to people and, you know, making people feel good, you know, expressing yourself and, and all these things in order to get what you need for your company. And so for me, over time, I would say that all the experiences that I had, you know, I think that I do use them. I do pull them forward. The only thing that's different is the design is different. You know, the fabrics that I'm using and and the approach to design is very different. But when it comes to understanding that you need marketing, but sales and production, all these other things need to come together. I think I got a lot of that from there that I can use, but not so much aesthetic and design and the process. So, I mean, that integration of the business process and the creative process is such an important balance that you need to strike in order to be successful. So on that note, I want to talk a little bit about your creative process. For our listeners, you should Google her work right now if you're not familiar with it, because her pieces are so striking. And by looking at them, you can see this collage of all your influences, right? They're historical, traditional, modern, and architectural, multicultural, and theatrical And flattering all at once. And so I can really feel how you've integrated all these different aspects of your life, all this different influence. And then the fact that you're turning this into a successful label and business means you're integrating all the stuff that you've learned. What's the workflow like when you're designing a collection and how do you get inspiration on demand? I love history and I love researching. So a lot of it is like, that's where it comes from. Like I go to the library, I'll go to museums. I love stuff like that. And so the inspiration usually comes from the past. And for me, because I want to explore a little bit of, um, or a lot of an inspiration that's from Africa. And I use the term Africa loosely because I don't pull from any specific country. You know, I am from Ghana, but I feel like because I moved here to the U.S. and I live in this like melting pot and it's been this, you know, cultural mixing, I feel like that's how I mix it, you know, when it comes to Africa, too, because that's what I know. You know, that's been my experience. So I'm just relating it in that way. So I move in, you know, from country to country. And what I'm interested in is the body of Africans, you know, before really pre-colonial times because I want to know what what were the practices that were being done to the body as adornment as if you know if you weren't wearing like full clothes how were you showing was it just a nude body or you know and then there's all these ideas of the decoration and where it started and that really really fascinates me you know like taking flowers and putting them on this part of your body or that part of your body or you know making tattoos or scarifications, which a lot of my you know work is based on. I take those ideas because a lot of times when we think about African fashion and what it means, you know, what that is, you know, automatically we're thinking about prints and all these, um, you know, bright colors and all these things. And, and yes, we can think about those things too. But there's like also like this wealth of, of other information that we never, you know, consider. And I... I find those things to be beautiful. I think that they should not, you know, we see different cultures and fashion all the time, but I want to see it done that way. And so I want to look further and I want to see what the ideas were for beauty, you know, before these clothes came into, you know, action. So I look at patterns that are drawn on the body and things like that. And I use them as kind of like the shapes or the adornments that influence the clothes. 
So whether it's like body piercings or it's like any kind of body modification, lengthening the neck or um, lengthening or shortening other body parts, those are the things that I'm really using for the inspiration. And when it comes to the prints, that comes more from the thoughts on like historical periods or the, the Victorian, the Edwardian, the all of that stuff that I kind of grew up with loving and then mixing that with like surreal kind of animals, like putting different body parts of animals together, like butterfly wings on monkeys and all these things to create like this surreal world. And that's just how I see the print. And so I'm often going into books and collecting images and pictures and they become collages for the prints that I use later on. And so for me, it's like all this, I can get like lost in the research. I love it, you know, and then I find all these elements and then I'm like, okay, well, you know, we need to now put them together. So I start, you know, with my mood boards and things come and go from the mood board all the time. And I'll just leave it on the wall and stare at it all the time when I'm walking back and forth. And then I start designing into things and I'm very specific when I'm designing. I'm not like someone who makes like 10 sketches to get down to one. I really like might make two to get to one. Like I know I, I sketch everything out on Illustrator. So the way that I sketch it is exactly how the item is going to come out. So it's always very specific. I know exactly what it's going to look like. And, you know, I usually do like a small, really tight, you know, collection. And leather is my favorite medium to use because it's like skin. And I like skin as an often reoccurring theme in my work. And that's it. So, you know, the process is really like telling a story also about like, you know, these things that are always contrasting. Because I feel like in my life, everything's always been contrasting. There's been America and then there's been Ghana and then there's been you know, living life in a better situation and being very poor. And I've gotten to experience like all these things all the time. And so, you know, there's like this dark leather and then there's like these colorful bright prints. And it's always like mixing like these two contrasting things that are always, you know, going together because I feel like that's how my life has been. You know, that's, that's how I try to embody it in the work. And how do you tell that story in a way that's like, really, really beautiful. You know, how do you bring those elements together? But then a step further is to think about, you know, your woman and where she's going to go in this thing, you know, and make it possible for her. Just thinking of, you know, the item and and how it can grow into something else or how it can inspire people or, or, you know, touch people. So I just think I'm always thinking about it in those different ways and just try to come up with design that is doing all those things all the time. One of the most important things is like sometimes, you know, people said to me, you know, I don't really see the Africa in your work. And I'm like, well, because you need to open your mind also to seeing things differently. There's so many parts of Africa. I mean, first of all, that term is like, it's so huge. And there's so many countries and there's so many tribes and there's so many cultures and there's so many languages that, you know, yeah, there's a lot of things you probably have not seen yet, you know, and um, hopefully we'll get to see even more and more and more. And so I just want it to be from a perspective that you first see the item and the item itself is just beautiful. And then the inspiration as to where it came from and all these things and all that stuff, but we're making fashion. So, you know, that to me is like the most important thing that the the design itself is right, you know, within the inspirations and all those other things. You can engage with your work on that level, right? It's beautiful, and the beauty is what draws you in. And then the more you spend time with it, the more you can kind of develop a relationship with it and start to unfold all the inspiration. But you can also tell that you've really crafted it with this idea of it having a life of its own, of it leaving your studio and and going out into the world to influence the world in a certain way. Anyway, that's my take on it. It definitely is a bright spot in the fashion world, I think. So thank you for taking us through your creative process. I felt like I got a little window into the mind of young Mimi Plange, like the one who would get lost in fantasy and stuff. Because when you started like talking about it, I was like sucked into like the, the middle earth of, <laughs> of your mind. <laughs> it's amazing. Mimi, your work came on our radar over at Design Milk because our team happened to be in Atlanta for Modern Atlanta, the Designist Human Festival this year. And 
you recently collaborated with Roche Bobois on some of their iconic designs using your fabric. Are you kind of creeping your way into the home arena? Do you foresee like a Mimi Plange interior collection? Definitely for sure. I mean, to, to even take it a step further, like today, you know, there's all these things around fashion and what it is and what it is not. And I just feel like you don't have to look at it in the way that we've looked at it in the past. Now, it seems like when people come into the mix with any kind of brand or something, it's not that unheard of to hear that that person also has another business here and another business there and another business there. And so I think that now you have to touch people on a lot of different levels. You know, if you can touch them musically, if you can touch them intellectually, if you can touch them physically, you know, people who, you know, they show you lifestyle all around. This is the way that I eat. This is everything about you know, the culture that I'm into and what I'm interested in. And I feel like having a brand now, it has to be something that can extend further. If you want it to be global, if you want it to be lifestyle, and that's what the goal is. You know, I don't want to stop it, just clothes. Clothes are awesome and clothes are great. But I think, you know, more so than anything, we're really now on the course of building a brand. And so we want these other elements in there. And, you know, we want to do these lifestyle, this, you know, Whatever it is, eyewear, shoes, perfumes, you know, we just want to keep it going. I'm really excited for that. Okay, so shifting gears to your personal life. I wonder if you can share with us, like, outside of work, what do you find to be one of the most fulfilling aspects of your life? And the other side of that coin is, what is also a challenge that you are still working on? Hmm. Well, one of the most fulfilling things I would say is that my business partner is actually my husband. And at the same time, it's also the most challenging thing, <laughs> you know, that we're working on. <laughs> is this the boyfriend who pushed you to start your own label before you were ready or before you thought you were ready, but you actually were ready? You just didn't know it. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is Yay. that same individual. That guy turned into a <laughs> husband. He must be a good character. He is an awesome character. He's like a pusher, you know, he's not going to let you feel like you cannot do anything. Like, I don't know. He is like, um, what is it? Like a leprechaun or something, <laughs> something that brings you good luck. <laughs> that you can like put it in your pocket and keep with you. He's like something like that. And so, um, he's, he's been amazing. You know, we've done everything together and, I feel like, you know, what he brings to it is like that determination because I'm more, you know, I can blow with the wind sometimes and, you know, and he's more like, you know, this is what we're doing. And then like, it's like, this is what we're doing, you know, mm -hmm. and that's, you know, where it is. So I think it's a good balance that we have on making decisions. And also, you know, with me being able to talk things through, because sometimes I think when you're a designer and I'll tell you one of my vulnerabilities is um, I know I even had this issue when I was working for a certain amount of time, but you know, wanting to do your vision and then that's it. Like being very, you know, close as to, I need to do this, this way. And when you bring somebody else into the mix, you know, you do kind of have to listen to what they say. I mean, you don't have to, but it just gives you, you know, you can see something from someone else's, perspective because then you start understanding that fashion is about people it's not about you you know and that's where the thing I think gets wrong between when designers are you know wanting to get out there in the world and and build their businesses it's not really about you it's really about people so if you can't listen to people's wants and needs not that they're always right but just to be able to you know see things in a, in a different way than where you look at them and I feel like having a partner that does that for me all the time but we have fun. I mean, we go through periods of time where we do everything together, like everything, you know, we work together and then we're going to the gym together and then we're going on our, riding our bikes together. It's like, oh my gosh, we're always together, you know, and then we go through periods of time <laughs> when um, we're a little bit more separate and things like that. But it's been, it's been good. And it's like when you are with the person that you work with, you know, I think when people are married or, or um, girlfriend and boyfriend, like you, you go to work and you have like the way that you are at work sometimes. And then you have like mm -hmm. this home life and like, but when you work together, it's like, I'm seeing you all the time and you can't really hide. It's like, that's how you are. And this is what you think. And so you get to know your partner, like every single aspect of ones that you don't want to know, the ones that you do want to know, <laughs> it's like it's all there. 
Yeah, you must get to know them so deeply and the full picture. And it must challenge you to get to this place of acceptance, right? Because in order to accept all the things you love about him, you also have to accept all the things that you find frustrating or that you think need work. <laughs> no, I was like, maybe that was too much sharing. No, <laughs> no, no. I, I love hearing that because if I worked with my husband, I would easily be jailed for homicide. Very <laughs> so I admire and respect and my hat is off to you guys for making that work so well. It, it works. It's, it's good. So if you're working with your husband all day, what's your off duty time like? Do you have a family? Um, do you visit your brothers and sisters? What do you guys do for fun? We love movies and that's really what is exciting for us when we're not working like crazy people. And I love making fermentations and I like making preserved foods like making confits and all this like crazy kitchen stuff. Like my kitchen's like a laboratory and I make like different granolas and like just like little things that you have to pack away and not touch until like eight months later. And then I'm scared to eat it because I think I'm going to die because I probably have something, <laughs> but I never do, <laughs> but I never do. So then I figure, okay, I'll try it again, you know, <laughs> until I do get sick. <laughs> so, so that's, you know, really what I do. <laughs> when I'm alone. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Are there any specific activities you do to keep your mind active or sharp or to keep it creative? Because I know running your own business, sometimes it's hard to continually be inspired or be creative. But is there anything that you do like a ritual or do you bring a sketchbook out into nature or anything like that? A lot of it is like looking through books. I really love books a lot. Um, mostly visual ones, <laughs> not ones with too much reading, but yes, I do love looking at images and I go to, sometimes I go to the photo library and um, I just like look at, you know, I'll just pick like certain topics and like go through all the images that are in the folders. And I think riding my bike clears my mind and traveling especially, I think is probably the biggest inspiration. Like for some reason, there's just something about when you go somewhere else and everything is new and, you know, you can think differently and then you can come back to where you were. And I feel like traveling just gives you all these things and experiences. And I feel like it's through the experiences and coming into contact with different people that, you know, makes it happen. I think it's music, a lot of really, you know, good music, music that, you know, makes you feel deeply and then music that's just for fun. And then just trying to think about, you know, what are people liking these days? Like, I mean, I don't know, for me, I just like talking to people and hearing what they, what they like, you know, right now or what they're into or what they're listening to. All those things are like inspirational. Like usually when people are talking to me, my mind is like racing about all these, you know, things that they're talking about. Along those lines, can you tell us like one thing in particular that you've seen or experienced lately that, that touched you deeply that was either insanely beautiful or just resonated with you that left a lasting impression? I don't know if it's beautiful. I don't know how it, I would describe it, but do all the work that we were, that we've been doing sometimes like when you're in it, everything is like going so fast and everything is like spinning out of control. So you don't slow down sometimes and like really see like all the steps that you're taking and that you're actually making these moves and that, you're actually doing what it is that you intended to do and that all of that is amazing and you have to appreciate it too because appreciating it is also what gives you more and you can't take things for granted and, you know, I learned that lesson a long time ago, but you cannot take any of it for granted because it's all special, you know, every little step of the way and so I think, you know, sometimes when it's like calm and right after when we've done an event, we get that feeling of when you rest, you can like, be able to enjoy it, I guess. That's really what I guess I mean. Sometimes I tend to forget that, like, you know, it should be fun, too. Yeah. I would say something that inspired me, but it's not like a positive thing, is recently I met a gentleman that works for this organization called Fashion Fights Cancer, and he was talking to me about, you know, the seminar classes that, you know, he does, and we're doing a project together, and he was telling me why he set up this foundation. 
you know, he was telling me about like these patients he has and the terminally ill patients. And I think sometimes like when you're spinning and you're doing this thing and it's like fashion, you know, and then like, there's like this real thing also that's going on in real life, you know, not just the fantasy and dream of beautiful things, you know, just him. He was so passionate about his project and the way he was talking about it to me, I was just like, I'm like, I was like blown away, you know, and it's not all that often that people talk to you. Yeah. And make you feel something, but I definitely felt, something and then like it did inspire me like okay well what can we do we can do this and this and it just like made my mind my mind has been racing I, I would say for like weeks about different things that just came from just that conversation yeah it's really beautiful and sometimes you do need a moment away because you get like so wrapped up in your own thing and what you're doing and then you get hit with like a big dose of of reality and then you're like oh you know we could be contributing to bettering, you know, people's lives in some way. Yeah. This is where my contribution to society can reach in a little bit, a little bit deeper and a little bit more meaningful. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's been another thing. And I, you know, I think about it all the time. And before I used to think of it in the way as, okay, when I get like so big, then I want to do this thing and, um, you know, give back, but you don't really have to wait till you're, you know, there's, so many different things that, you know, you can do and it just has to be part of like, I think like always when you get like, whatever you're giving is what you're getting too, you know, and not that you should do it to get anything, but you have to, I, I just, I believe in like energy, you know, and I just think it's all connected in that way. And like, you know, just trying to be, of course, you're busy running a company and things, but then thinking about, you know, other people may not even have had what you've had to even get to where you are, you know? So it's like giving back, I guess. You're a powerful lady. So what's the big picture vision for the studio? You mentioned previously you were interested in becoming a lifestyle brand. Is that kind of where you think things are heading at this point? I definitely feel like what we're doing is, you know, very modern. I think it's not, you know, it's not really necessarily about the price point or anything like that. that we're doing. I don't even think that those things matter anymore. It just matters like, you know, what's your message and, and what are you about and do I want it? That's the goal is to just keep on pushing and to never, ever stop. So I don't know what this can morph into, but I don't think I'm ever going to stop trying to morph it into something. <laughs> well, speaking of the long term, who do you want to be? What kind of person do you imagine yourself when you are all grown up, like 80 years old? I want to be my husband. <laughs> really? <laughs> I really do. <laughs> That's a ringing endorsement. I really am fascinated by him, like, as, like, a thing, too. <laughs> you know, not just, like, a person, but he's, like, very disciplined. And he's, like, kind of, like, opposite of of me, so, in a lot of ways. But then, you know, there's core things that, you know, we believe in the same way. But I don't know. I just think, like, just getting a little bit more discipline, you know, a little bit more things about, you know, just yourself and how you deal with you. I think it's like a wonderful thing to be so strong in your convictions and to generally be happy, you know, and it seems like it doesn't really take much to make me happy. So that seems to be a good, you know, trait to have. That is a good trait to have. I love people who laugh easily and, you know, can experience joy easily. It's also very contagious. It's wonderful to be around. Yes. <laughs> you know, I, I just think everything is like what you believe, you know, and I didn't want to live my life and not try to do this thing that I believed I could do. And so, you know, it's just like just going for it and just being happy in the end that you did everything that you could with the time that you had, because the time is really, really, really short. Is there anything in particular that you would like our listeners to keep an eye out for? Do you have any collections coming out soon? I know you mentioned handbags uh, or do you have any events coming up or anything we should keep tabs on? A project that we're going to be working on with two companies, the gentleman I, I mentioned before, um, Ty Cantor, who runs the fashion site Cancer, we're teaming up with them to do an event, possibly during around the time of Fashion Week, where we're going to work with some of their patients and students to create some pieces. And then we're also going to tell the story of our whole experience on a website called Take It To, which was started by a friend of mine named Marcus Mam. And what they do is they have like experiences of stories that are shared, like where you have like a page, it's almost like an Instagram, but you have like your whole 
page all together of all the work that you do and and um and there's like this new focus of people who use design to give back to communities and so because that is the focus of this platform now we're going to debut it by telling the story of us working with you know the patients and creating this event and the whole story is going to be told on the platform. So it's going to be really amazing. We're going to shoot a film around it. That's great. And what's the URL for that again? Well, right now um, it's take it dot two. Okay. And then there's fashion fights, cancer.org. And then there's Mimi plunge.com. Great. And you are on social media too. Is it at Mimi plunge? Yes. All around Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. All right. And take it too. You have been so amazing to talk to. No, thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking with you guys as well. I'm really glad we got to talk. Yeah, me too. Thank you so much, Mimi. Wow, she's really awesome. I felt like so connected to her during that whole talk, even though like our backgrounds couldn't be more different, really. I loved how she was able to really articulate for us, really paint the picture in vivid brushstrokes of all those different cultural influences, right? Like um, her feeling of like displacement in Southern California, American culture, but then having like this really traditional Ghanaian, you know, practices and culture at home with the food and the dress and her family. And she was able to really articulate that in a way that I felt almost lost in a fairy tale, you know? And I think she she kind of looks at her life like a fairy tale. Because, I mean, and I don't mean like a princess and, you know, Prince Charming kind of fairy tale. I mean, like a fantasy. Because she talks a lot about, like, uh, using art as escapism and that there was just a lot of fantasy that surrounded her youth and had a big impact on her. I love how she's been able to incorporate that, but also bring in you know, African heritage and and traditions all and mix it all together. I love that she talks about, you know, looking at different tribes and different ways that people are adorning their bodies, whether it be with jewelry or scarification or tattooing or whatever. Um, And just like mixing elements of of some of that and making animal hybrids, which I thought was really cool. Yeah. I love that she's been able to take all of these traditional things and make them fantastical. She has such a rich inner world, you can tell, that when she pulls in all these influences and they sort of swim around in the consciousness, the unconsciousness of Mimi Plange, and then they come back out in this like reimagined, awesome kind of context. It's fascinating. You know, now I just want to go watch The Dark Crystal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I like that there's a, there's a powerful woman that inspired her throughout this too. And, and she's also found a way to align herself with a powerful man. It's a triangulation of awesome, clearly. Total props to, to Mimi's mom, too, for setting an amazing example. And, you know, Mimi taking that to the next level and dressing Michelle Obama. That was an amazing story. Yeah. Okay, now I'm going to go draw some dragons and angels and watch Labyrinth. Thanks for listening, everybody. Please make sure you subscribe to us on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. And definitely sign up for our newsletter, read the show notes, and see images of Mimi's work at our website, cleverpodcast.com. Connect with us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Clever Podcast. We always love hearing from you. This episode of Clever was edited by Chris Modal of Your Studio with music by L1011. 